Hello, welcome to uh, a new series of shows that we're doing on Cosmic Shambles. Uh, and this is for some of you may well have uh, watched before about it's probably actually about two months ago, we did uh, a panel on COVID-19 with uh, people who are currently researching it involved in, in trying to to understand it. And people are from from a background which has a, a level of expertise. Uh, so we decided to do a follow up to that because of course, in the last two months, we found out a lot more things. We've also found out a lot more things that uh, we still don't know as well these are these strange times that we're living in and we also know that many of you have new questions the questions that in terms of understanding of the changes that we're seeing in uh the way that we're, be we're being told to behave in society and and culturally what what should we definitely know what should we know how should we arm ourselves so i'll give you a few details of the new series we're doing this is basically it's a genetic shambles series today we're dealing with covid19 we're going to be talking about a lot of other things as well uh, we're going to do 12 uh, live stream shows which are going to be conversations interviews and uh, research presented in partnership with Genetic Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution, which is at the University of Bath. Uh, so thank you to them for making these shows possible. And uh, this will then be going up exclusively on the Shambles YouTube channel. So uh, if there's anyone else you want to see this, if you're watching this live and you think I'd like a friend of mine who's working at the moment, uh, these are going to be uh, continue to be available. Uh, so as I said, we're going to start with COVID-19. Uh, and I'll just quickly, by, by the way, mention that the main website is Cosmic Shambles dot com slash genetic shambles so uh, that's where you're going to find all the 12 episodes over time so today's panel two of them we had on last time and uh, now we have the person who was originally going to be on as well uh but unfortunately am i allowed to i, I presume i'm allowed to mention why uh, the last time she wasn't on was because she actually uh, did have covid19 so uh, as well as having uh, expertise in this area as well she has the, the the personal experience of having suffered with it that is professor sheena crooks shank who is an immunologist and professor in biomedical sciences, sciences and public Public Engagement Engagement University, University of, of Manchester. Manchester. Uh, we're joined again by Professor Edward Fail. He's from University of Bath and works on pathogen molecular evolution and genomics primarily in relation to infectious bacteria that causes disease. And we're also joined again by Dr. Ellen Brooks, who is a mathematical modeler within public health and epidemiology and is a lecturer at the University of Bristol on mathematical modeling as part of the Health Protection Research Unit. So that is uh, the university challenge for today. And your starter for 10 is... Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, thank you, everyone, who sent questions. We're going to try and deal with as many as possible. I just want to start off because, as I said, it was about two months ago. Uh, if I start with you, Ellen, do you feel, in, in terms of, of research and understanding and the experiences that we're watching, have we seen a, a, a very changeable picture from what, what we knew at the beginning of April? Well... I think, I mean, we've learned a lot since April. We um, ha now have a good idea of how quickly this virus spreads in the population and what combinations of measures are needed to control transmission. So uh, it was only at the beginning of April when we'd just gone into lockdown, it wasn't clear what kind of impact that was going to have on the reproduction number, the R number. But we obviously know now that lockdown and these uh, extreme physical distancing measures are effective at reducing the reproduction number and, and reducing transmission. Um, and so there are lots of things that we know now, and uh, there's lots of mathematical models that have been developed since April, looking at various aspects of, of coronavirus transmission, but there's still things we don't know. And it has been surprising to me how, for example, how challenging it's been to really nail down the importance of asymptomatic transmission or how diff difficult it's been modelling transmission in care homes, for example. Can I ask, because you mentioned the R number there, this yeah. is a, a question that's actually come from uh, my, my niece, who's a paediatric nurse, and she was sitting with some doctors today, and one of the questions they were most interested in, in having some understanding was, when we see a change in policy, when we ch see a change in the way that people are, are behaving outside socially in work environments, <laughs> how long... Yeah will it be before we may expect to see a change in the R number? Because I think some people are thinking if they don't see a change within a week, then that means that that change in behaviour is absolutely fine. And so it would be very interesting to know what the kind of time scale is that we're talking about here. Yeah, so the change is longer than a week. But for example, um, we went into lockdown on the 23rd of March 
And we didn't actually see an effect of changing transmission until at least a week later. And that's because we didn't stop household contact. So anyone who was infected on the 23rd of March might have gone home and still infected the people in that household. So it took a while for that lockdown to have an effect. And then on top of that, the R number, the reproduction number, as modelers call it, is estimated from data on hospital admissions and data on deaths. Data on deaths tends to be the most reliable data. And so it takes a while for uh, changes in transmission, changes in the street and people's interactions to, to filter through, if you like, into changes in the numbers of deaths. And that can be at least a month after changes that we observed among contact patterns to have an impact on the numbers of deaths. So there is quite a long delay between an actual change in behaviour and a change in, in the R number. Um, I mean, and as we ease lockdown and that we see changes in people's contact patterns, um, we really need to, I mean, our modelling looks like we need to maintain any changes for around three months in order to avoid a spike, a new spike in cases. Sheena, can I ask you just? Uh, sorry, this I'm, I'm throwing questions at, at you, but just because you're you're based up in Manchester, and we have been reading that, for instance, in the in the northwest and the southwest, that the R number seems to be higher uh, than in some other parts of of of, of England and, and indeed across the UK. Is, is that accurate information? As as far as I believe, I think there is some debate about what the actual R numbers are because there's, um, I believe there's two places that the uh, testing results are going via. And I know Andy Burnham, the mayor of of Manchester, is really complaining because he can't access both data sets. And without both data sets, he can't, we can't definitively say that the R is but the feeling has always been that we've been a little behind London in terms of catching up with our R number and our peak was coming after London so I, I, I believe it is indeed still higher that's certainly what the Public Health England data is saying. And Ed you're down in Bath and we were saying there oh sorry yes if, if you'd like to add something as well to that. Yeah well, well I was going, representing the, the southwest of course you, you mentioned that the R's uh, a bit higher there as well. Um, I was going to point out that the, 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 there's a really quite big difference between the northwest and the southwest in terms of the number of cases um, so we've actually got off reasonably lightly uh, in the southwest in terms of the overall number of <coughs> excuse me number of cases and deaths um, and of course that matters greatly as well as the R um, in terms of, of how the, the 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 danger of it spreading and I think that there was one um, uh, kind of uh, Illustrative, potentially um, a, a, a portent of things to come happened in the southwest, which was this big outbreak in the hospital in Western Supermare, which is actually quite a big outbreak of about a hundred uh, staff in the hospital. Um, so there was they they you probably saw it on the news. They they closed to new admissions, and there was a big worry at the time about uh, that, that was due to the people flocking the beaches over the, the nice weather and so on. But I don't think it was. I think it was just uh, uh, an outbreak that started in the hospital um, that, that that's actually spread very quickly. And I think that this this is the kind of pattern that we're likely to see, actually, that these uh, relatively localised flare-ups uh, uh, resulting from, you can call them super spreading events, if you like, or, or whatever you want to call them. But these clusters of cases is really what we've got to be looking out for now and really why it's so important to get the the test track isolation capacity up to speed which i'm sure we'll talk about more later on i yes, can so add as well just um on i mean as the number of cases, cases decline it actually, it actually becomes actually, more difficult to estimate the reproduction number because the reproduction number is the average number of secondary cases so if you have very few cases then it's much more subject to fluctuations. It's much less, um, much less stable and much more difficult to estimate. So I think that's part of the reason why the estimate in the Southwest has seemed to be higher is actually because we've got a low number of cases, not that it's genuinely higher in, in you the can, Southwest. You can see that in the confidence intervals. I think they went from about 0.7 to 1.3, so a massive range mm -hmm. uh, of uncertainty in that number. 
but we're, we're, we're also seeing it. There's, <laughs> there's studies going on um, looking at patients' bloods, uh, studying the immunology of them in Manchester, and our patient numbers dropped a lot, but now they're starting to, to go up again. So we are seeing, you know, from our own reflection, um, changes happening. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the first question is from James, and uh, I think probably all of you might have an opinion on this. Uh, he says that in the first COVID q and it was stated that we should trust the government as they have the largest pool of scientific data to hand. I think it was actually Public Health England was was the uh, rather than. Uh, and uh, is that still the case since to James, it seems to have become tribal and politicised more than rational and scientific? Um, who would like to start on on their feelings on that? I shouldn't say feelings on their evidence-based <laughs> opinion on that. I'll go on. I'll start. <laughs> um, um, I, I mean, I, I find it. I find it quite difficult looking at, at some of the decisions that have been made, um, and I sometimes feel that they've been hiding behind this sort of science, being led by the science, and and for a while it wasn't very clear what the constituents of the science were. I know there was a lot of concern from the immunology community when herd immunity seemed to be leading the way because that wasn't how we as immunologists think of, of herd immunity. And the use of that term seemed really inappropriate to us and we certainly kind of um, reared up about that. And of course, subsequently, it turns out they actually have relatively little immunology kind of expertise on the panel. So I think there are some really, really good people advising. There looks like for the last few weeks, there seems to be more um, disagreement between the experts uh, in the panel and the government. And I guess the government are also having to think about other needs like the economic needs of the country. And that is a very real, that has effects on people's mental health, people's well-being as well, alongside the health. And I don't know, it's not an easy one, but I, I don't necessarily feel as secure. I don't know if I ever felt completely secure in truth, but I don't feel that secure right now. But that's my perspective. Could I just ask you something? When you herd immunity and you said people in the immunology community that's not how they perceive herd immunity could you just break it up then what you would see is your definition and what you felt was the uh, the government's definition well i'm not saying the definition was different but the way to it was different so herd immunity it refers to the proportion of, of any population that needs to be resistant to an infection to protect the the vulnerable and normally this is achieved through vaccination, which is a way of achieving a memory response and achieving immunity. But what the government were proposing to do was to achieve it through natural infection. And this was an infection that was brand new to the world. This was an infection that was appearing to already have some really unpleasant and unintended consequences, including potentially high mortality and, as we saw, really quite high mortality and we in immunology felt that that was not appropriate that this was not that wasn't the way to get herd immunity and I and we don't know if this is an infection that we can be truly immune to and so whether or not herd immunity was actually achievable was another real concern. So we, we we felt very anxious about it. We wrote a letter where we worked with the British Society for Immunology to write a letter about it to say we're really unhappy about this. We would like to see the data. We'd like to understand how these decisions are being made. And of course, it was quickly backtracked in any case. And they claimed that that hadn't been the guiding force. Although it keeps, it keeps rearing its head again. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I said in the first, first, uh, first one of these that herd immunity wasn't a policy. And I, all the discussions I was in, it was never an aim that we that herd immunity would be the kind of the target of what we were trying to achieve. It's, it was just kind of byproduct and a um, something that's common to all infectious diseases and how we think about their dynamics. I mean, I've been, um, in terms of the science, I think... It is difficult to interpret the science that's out there because you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. People disagree. Some people get things wrong. Some people get things right. And that is quite difficult to interpret, especially if you're not a scientist or not a scientist in a particular area. 
But my, exper- my experience, I'm on, um, I contribute to SPIM, which is the modelling subgroup of SAGE. And my experience has been quite positive of the way scientific opinion has con- um, has progressed during this period. I mean, there's um, about 50 uh, mathematical modellers who sit on SPIM and we have long discussions, hours, three hour long discussions on, for example, the different aspects of the R number, whether we should be, um, you know, how we should be estimating what's the most accurate way of reporting things, discussing and reviewing each other's models. And I found that whole process actually quite reassuring because it's not just one model that all policy is based on, it's 40 or 50 models that are being reviewed by lots of different people and contributing to evidence. And that is different to the policy that's made, but actually the process by which science has worked during this period, I have thought has been interesting and reassuring. Ed, would you like to add anything to that? Um, well, I don't move in the same sort of circles, circles as Ellen, so I have to take that <laughs> on face value that, that that's how it that's all it, how it happened. I, I mean, I would just say that I do get a, a a slight sense from the outside, as it were, that there has been a certain amount of um, exceptionalism going on, and I, I would have liked to have seen uh, a, a, a lot more learning from what other countries are doing earlier on. And I think I get the the feeling that the countries that did well, like Germany and New Zealand, they really took notice of what the, the East Asian countries were doing in terms of track and trace and potentially face masks and, and, and all the rest of it. Whereas I think there was a, there was a sense that we we're kind of building our own strategy almost from, from scratch. And I, I, I mean, Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the, possibly we were a little bit blindsided by the fact that it wasn't flu as well, I think, from the, from the early days. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think, but it, you know, it seems that 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 there were elements like the speed of spread of the of the virus in, in, during March um, that that uh, took us by surprise. Um, well, uh, the next question, uh, this is from uh, Craig. Uh, Craig would like to know, uh, the thing I would find most useful right now would be really clear, concise explanation of why the exosome uh conjecture that's been doing the rounds in certain quarters of the past two months might not be true so let's start on exosome does anyone know what an exosome is no <laughs> well there we are i don't know that they, they this is uh this was this intrigued me that's why i was so worried about actually pronouncing that one there we are that was uh so the exosome conjecture has not been doing the rounds it hasn't been doing three. The <laughs> yeah. so it i don't know what that's to do with droplets i don't know we will we will uh, we'll double check on that the uh um so uh craig there we are it's been doing the rounds around your way but not as much around manchester bath and bristol as yet um vanessa would like to know have we learned anything massively new about the virus itself in the last two months since the last COVID, uh, uh and has that changed the initial vaccine strategy so um sheena can i start with you on on that well, I think, I think they're two separate questions. We are learning about the uh, the, the virus every single every single day. I've never seen such an, a kind of volume of, of new papers coming out, which are feeding into all sorts of different aspects. In terms of the immunology, we've certainly found out a lot about the early response to to the virus. So we know that there seems to be particular um, differences in the response of some of the initial responders to infection. So for example, there's a, a, a white blood cell type called a macrophage. This is really important at, at helping kind of gobble up uh, infected cells and virus. And depending on how that, that macrophage is activated, it can also help kind of switch on repair and kind of remodeling and kind of nurturing of a, of a healthy tissue again. And that doesn't seem to be working very well in the patients who get very, very sick. So there seems to be some particular issues around there. We're also starting to learn a lot more about the lymphocytes, which are another type of white blood cell. And they're the type of blood cell that's going to be really, really important in potentially giving you a memory response. So one of the things that we're learning is that there's there's types of cells called T cells. T cells are really critical cells for programming a good 
long-term memory response and helping to kill a virus or another type of pathogen. The cells that actually kill the virus seem to be recognizing structures inside the virus, whereas the the cells that help make antibody production and, and are involved with antibody production seem to be recognizing things on the outside of the virus. And that's quite important because it starts to tell us things about what might be a good way to design a vaccine. So at the moment, the, the vaccine candidates have really been focusing on those outer spikes. And that's a good strategy because that's how the virus latches onto cells to get into them. But... Um, the initial study um, in Oxford, when they looked at macaques, suggested that the macaques weren't completely resistant to getting another infection, but they got a, they got a less severe infection. So that doesn't mean that that vaccine is going to be working the same in humans, because humans get, get sicker than macaques anyway. Um, but if that's the case, then what that vaccine will, could still be good for is making people have a less severe disease but it also means that we may yet need to do a little bit of refining to try and get a vaccine candidate that might give 100 percent protection but this is all we're all learning we're learning live as we're we're doing the experiments would anyone like to add anything to to that or move on to the next question if you uh, the uh, next one, this is, uh, there's a lot of questions about resurgence, so I realise we, we may well kind of cover some of the same ground on this, but this is uh, this is from Andrew, who very kindly says that he hopes this finds us all well. I uh, hope you all are. Uh, there seems to be great concern that a second wave is possible from the current pandemic. The information I've seen suggests that second waves usually occur around six months after the initial outbreak, if they reoccur at all, with this type of virus. This means it will likely begin around the start of the flu season. Could your panel discuss the possible frequency of such waves occurring, and could the current protests as need as they are may will they have an impact on the time lag between the waves uh can i start with you paul what is called yep no nope. i just call you paul me ed, I'm not paul. i'll call you ed i'll call you ed now <laughs> why did i call you paul i've done this I twice <laughs> confuse me all right <laughs> so, so um, um Oh, that's um, right, because Paul's got the next question. I just oh, read I that. Okay, that's what yeah, happens yeah. with me. If you've seen the film Anchorman, you'll know what just happened. Call me Paul if you like. That's okay. I've had worse. Um, so I, I've never um, believed that a second wave is inevitable. I, I, I think that, that um, I've always been sort of cautiously optimistic that, that if we uh, manage it right and very cautiously and, and with with the right degree of, of patience, essentially, um, that we can we can avoid a, a second spike. I think that there were two conditions that I would have liked to have um, seen in place before the, uh, the, 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 the restrictions were started to be eased. One, the, the cases go right down, and the second is the, 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 the test, track, and trace um, at full capacity. Um, I'm not... 100% confident that either of those conditions were met. Um, so that's that's a concern. Um, it's also the seasonality is a concern. Um, so it's it really is clear, I think, that the um, the risks of uh, getting infected are much lower outside than inside. So whilst the weather, well, the weather's not so nice at the moment, but while the weather has been nice, I think that that was really uh, 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 a benefit um, and really limiting the, the the transmission. So how that's going to change as as the 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 weather gets worse and more and more people go back to work, that's that's a concern. Um, but you know, it, uh, come back to what I said earlier about the clusters. I mean, I think it's it's the it, it's it's kind of this 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 um, this pattern um, where you get sort of localized flare ups is kind of good news and bad news at the same time as I see it. So it's it's bad news in that single events can actually very quickly increase the total number of cases um, and potentially spiral out of control. But it's also good news in the sense that if it allows a much more targeted approach if the capacity is in place locally to nip those in the bud, so to speak, um, before they sort of spiral out of control and you get much larger scale onward uh, transmission in the community so so that's where i would like to see the priorities now in really sort of being 
targeted towards very rapid identification of, of, of those localized outbreaks um, and getting the, the contact tracing in place to, to deal with it. But, you know, the app would be good as well if that ever works. Um, uh, you know, the, but the traditional sort of contact tracing that we, we've always kind of done, um, we need to, that, that, that works as well if, we, if we've got the capacity in place. So I don't think it's inevitable that we will see a second um, wave. Um, but I'm fearful that we will if we don't do, don't get those basic things right. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Paul. Um, Ellen, uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, well, I was going to add that if we do see a second wave, then the timescales between uh, waves would be uh, dependent on the generation time. So that's the time between successive cases. So if I'm diagnosed today and I infect you, then you'll be diagnosed in seven days time. So it's that generation time of seven days that is really critical for determining when, um, when a second wave would happen if we didn't get transmission under control. Just as a comparison for flu, it's more like three days. So flu is a must, much faster infection than coronavirus. Um, and then the second thing that impacts the timing of second wave is how quickly we resume normal life. Um, I mean, our early work in February, we estimated that under normal conditions, an epidemic would peak, a coronavirus epidemic would peak in the UK after around four months. Um, and we, we're not expecting normal conditions again, but um, we obviously have to be careful that if a second wave does come, that it doesn't coincide with the flu season, um, because that wouldn't be a good thing in terms of hospital capacity. I, I can add something about the protests. I mean, the current protests, you see them all on telly, people are very close together, but I'd just add to what Ed said is that they are outdoors, which limits transmission. Many of the people are wearing face masks, which also limits transmission. And also um, the demographics of the people there uh, makes an impact, has an impact on transmission. So younger people are less likely to have symptoms, so potentially less infectious. So I'm actually quite hopeful that the current protests won't have that large an impact on overall transmission. Brilliant. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, this is uh, from Lorraine. For I'll, I'll start with you on the shin. Uh, Lorraine has read a lot about how it's now thought that COVID-19 might be a blood vessel disease rather than a lung-related one. What is the current thought on this? And she also has a supplementary question. Is it common to discover a disease is something very different from what we first thought? So that's a, it's a really good question, and that's that's kind of spot on with how the research is going. So the, the virus uses... Um, uses, and my brain's gone blank, can't remember the name, name of the receptor, but the receptor is basically expressed on lung epithelial cells and gut epithelial cells. So those are the cells that line the, the kind of surface that's in contact with the air within your lungs and within your gut. But the receptor is also expressed on your blood vessels as well. So it's hard, It's not in a way, it's not surprising that as well as getting in through those epithelial cells into the lungs, it can then also affect the blood vessels. And where they're looking at the studies of, of, sort of seeing some of the worst cases, sort of talking about comorbidities, a lot of those seem to be blood vessel related so we're seeing lots of things linked to obesity diabetes heart problems so that again would fit with with you know a system that's already perhaps you know having a little bit of trouble and then getting getting this second assault on top of it i think in terms of you know learning about an infection we're learning about the infection live this infection is not quite like mers and it's not quite like sars it's somewhere in between and we are learning about it. And, and I think when, when you're learning about any new infection, you can make new discoveries as you go along. It doesn't nullify the initial discoveries about how the, the virus gets into the lungs and things, but it, it's just evolving knowledge, I think, is probably fair to say. Um, I just wondered, actually, from, from all through, it's, how much has changed in terms of our understanding who, what groups may be more susceptible? Because I think there's a lot of people are very worried with some you know, relatives or friends where even if things are looking better, they still go, do you know what? We have to be very, very, have we changed our understanding of those people that we should be really careful around in, in the last few months? Um, Ed, I'll start with you. I, I, I think that, I, I think that, that it hasn't really changed in terms of who the most vulnerable are. Well, I mean, with the, the, 
the the science has, has firmed up a little bit in terms of, of the risk factors. We know that um, diabetes uh, is a big risk factor, but it's a risk factor for lots of things, and obesity as well is also a big um, risk factor. But you know, essentially, age is the big one, <laughs> which we've known since since the start. Um, and uh, being male is also uh, quite a significant um, factor, so that hasn't changed. And that's so. There's this this the interesting uh, difference is is with the the BAME groups, um, and there was because uh, that's really quite striking. There's the statistics on um, so, uh, and there's been quite a lot of debate around the causes of that. Whether how it's uh, nature, the genetics, and what degree it's the nurture, the sort of social democra- uh, uh, demographic factors, and I think the 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 the, the evidence is pointing more towards the, the latter, as I understand it. That that's that's still uh, uh, a slightly uh, a, a bit of a mystery, I would say. Um, but it seems to me that that what's what that there are <laughs> what's kind of weird is the, the unpredictability of that. So these are general patterns, but there's there's many many exceptions. Um, and there's a wide variety of symptoms over all age groups, it seems to me. And you have these uh, certain proportion of cases that take a long time to recover as well, um, which is becoming more clear. So, so uh, you know, there's a, it seems to me, you know, it's not my field, but it seems to me that the, the more we find out, the more questions are actually raised about what this virus is actually doing um, to the body, uh, b- besides the lungs, all the other organs as well. <clears throat> Ellen, can I ask, because a lot of people in live, in chat, live are chat are asking about uh, masks at the moment, and this is one that was sent in before from Paul. Uh, he said, what is the science behind masks? Uh, was the reason they were not pushed before uh, because of scarcity, uh, essentially keeping them back for key workers? So what, what do we know about the, uh, uh, the, the use of masks and, and how useful they are? Yeah, so masks is a really tricky area, and that's because the evidence behind them is quite uncertain so to some extent it does look like that face masks stop you if you if you're coughing it stops you spreading it to other people probably doesn't stop you getting infected if someone's coughing on you and you're wearing a face mask um but the reason i think that they weren't introduced uh, or recommended earlier is because um there's all sorts of other factors that affect their use. I mean, one aspect was reserving them for key workers, but also it, people have uh, found that if you wear a face mask, people touch their face more, which is not a good idea. And they also might be less likely to observe social distancing. So social distancing is the best thing you can do, being two metres away. And um, if you put a face mask on, that doesn't negate that. And so there was... Um, a lot of discussion and uncertainty about whether um, whether you'd actually do more harm than good recommending that everyone wears a face mask if it meant that people change their behaviour and touch their face much more than they would have done anyway. Yeah, also I wore one to the post office the other day and it made my ears look very big. So uh, that's another side to it as well. Um, this is from uh, Terry. Terry says uh, he is curious about the speed of research. Uh, the last COVID panel was around two months ago in terms of research and understanding of the virus. Again, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think it is worth dealing with more. Um, have you been surprised by the speed of research? Have you been surprised by any of the revelations uh, within that research? Um, who would like to begin on that? Sheena, would you like to? Uh, yeah, I can say something about it. I think what's one of the, the things that's, um, I guess, almost delighted me about the, the research that's happening is the degree of, of cooperation across disciplines to be able to address this. Um, you know, in Manchester, we're doing a big study on it. And, you know, we've got clinical, uh, clinical colleagues working together with uh, people in chemistry working, looking at kind of diagnostics. We've got people in the labs working. It's just this wonderful collaboration across across disciplines. And what the, the kind of lead of that research has said is, the way that they're doing this research, it's so live, you know, they're talking to the journal about when they're going to get it out as well, is 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 something that she doesn't want to lose. So whatever happens sort of moving forward, I think it's really taught us about ways that we can do di- research differently. So I'm not sure that entirely answers your question, but it's a slightly different take on it. 
How's that so, cast, Ed and Ellen, as well? Is that one of, again, when we're always trying to find certain positive things within uh, sometimes terrible situations, the speed of collaboration that we certainly, you know, we were talking with Rupert last time as well, and it, and it seems that that is one of the things that we can uh, take away from this, which is a lot of people seem to drop tools on pretty much all other research they were doing, and various institutions said, this is where, where we're working now. I mean, I mean Ed, does, does this give you uh, some sense of, of optimism about human in those actions? Absolutely. I, I completely agree with what Sheena said, and, and, and in my field, of, which is more of the, the molecular, the genomics side, it, it's been absolutely remarkable the 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 amount of 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 collaboration and data sharing from the very start i mean the uh, credit to the chinese they released their their genome data really really early on um and that that helped massively um for the development of the tests and to start working on the vaccines and everything else um and you know the the just in the uk i think there's the there's the cogs genome consortium they've released a really nice study in the last few days they 25,000 genomes they sequence of this virus now which I, th I think is more than any other country it's, it's quite it's quite amazing how everyone's pulled together and it, it, and, it, and it is very heartening and you know you you you, you really hope that that you, somehow you can capture that feeling when it when the necessity kind of drains away over time that you still want to keep that 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 feeling of pulling together um going for as long as possible ellen yeah i just really agree with what ed and sheena have, have said really i mean uh, for example in bristol um for several months and we've now gone down to only having bristol wide uh, teleconferences three times a week but at one point we were having teleconferences with everybody who's working on coronavirus uh, in Bristol University, so immunologists, lab people, mathematicians, statisticians, um, clinicians, uh, every day at nine o'clock we were all on a teleconference together and there's been just a huge amount of collaboration, data sharing and also just the way in which um, papers and science is being published is just so much faster, things are coming out on the archive rather than waiting for months for things to go through journals and um, yeah it's it's been it's been fascinating to be part of from a scientific point of view. Um, this is, and I realise this. The next question is: it may well be be difficult for you. And I'm I'm going to start with you, Sheena, on this just because of your own um, personal experience as well. This is from Fiona, and Fiona says the focus in the UK seems to be on delivering critical care in ICU. Primary health advice for those with symptoms has been scant, i.e., stay at home and take paracetamol. What primary health care advice would the panel give to those first experiencing symptoms? So uh, you will, none of you will be held for any legally to this, but it is you know it is interesting, especially from from your perspective uh, Sheena what what advice could you give I think that, that that pretty much is the advice you want to take things that potentially reduce the fever and the discomfort you get terrible terrible uh, aches with the with the virus and um, paracetamol will help ibuprofen is fine as well there was advice I think I think initially that there was concerns that ibuprofen wouldn't be okay, but actually it looks like ibuprofen is is fine. That that that's that that's been kind of overridden. Um, plenty of fluids, plenty of rest. Take it very seriously. I think that is my biggest message. Take it seriously. Don't try and rush to do things before you feel well. I think that was my personal experience as I rushed in to try and, and you know, be super duper and still try and do kind of meetings with people and, and make the kids tea and things. And it, it just floored me. And then I couldn't breathe very well. And that really shocked me and I got quite scared. And, and I think we saw it as well with Boris Johnson as well. I suspect he was, you know, obviously trying to work, continue working and didn't take it seriously. So take it seriously, rest. Would anyone else would like to like to add anything to that? Because that does seem to be one of the things that we first heard when 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 it when we were first reading about this. I think a lot of people we were saying before we started doing this tonight. You know, people go, "Oh, I hope I get it soon so I can just get it over and done with." And of course, actually, there's been you know, I'm sure all of us have friends who've had terrible experiences or, or you know things that have been worse. And that seems to have been one of the misunderstandings. I think within in the UK of of just I mean does anyone, why when there were so many cases around the world and we were you know the we we were not the first country by any means what why do you think this the information had not got through in terms of uh, the severity the possible severity of of, of this. 
I guess people like to underplay their risk. Mm. I mean, I, I think people like to be optimistic that they'll be okay and and they'll be fine. I don't think we truly were appreciating or I guess we were thinking it was going to happen to somebody else. I mean, you know, we're almost at the point now where, you know, my husband's saying to me, I almost wish we hadn't have it, had it now because we went through all that pain and, you know, all those those weeks afterwards of having chest pain and not really feeling like we'd recovered. And we don't even know definitively if we're going to be immune, <laughs> if, mm -hmm. you know, if, if moving forward. And so it almost feels like it's a waste. And we also weren't able to get tested. So for all I know, you know, I had the symptoms. I may not have had COVID. And if I manage to get an antibody test, I may not have sufficient antibody levels anymore by the time I get the test. So there is that frustration of, you know, we won't even necessarily see the benefit. But I don't know. I mean, you're going to say something, I think. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the public messaging is really, really difficult. Um, and I think that the, the, there was a very uh, um, conscious, a very a, a big awareness of, of not making people panic. And um, the, 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 the message that I heard again and again in, in the early days was that I must stress, must emphasize in 80 percent of cases, you'll have mild or no symptoms and you'll be absolutely fine. And that that kept coming over and over and over. So it, it seemed like it was either, well, the majority of times you're going to be absolutely fine or those very small, maybe under 1% of the times you're going to be dead. And there wasn't much discussion about what happens in between, you know, what it's actually like to catch the thing and to go through the, what the symptoms would be. I guess there wasn't so much known about the symptoms, but there wasn't, uh, you know, we knew that 20% of the cases were, were going to be relatively uh, severe, um, but it wasn't that wasn't really brought out in that early messaging at all. So, and I think that you know, there, there was a there was a sort of pulling back a little bit from that, for, probably for very good reasons because it didn't want to raise a whole load of panic. I think as well, um, I'd say uh, in the UK, don't have much experience with infectious diseases. We are vaccinated against lots of horrible infectious diseases. So, you know, we kind of, we, I don't, I mean, just thinking me personally, I don't really have any experience of bad infectious diseases. Never seen measles. I've never seen other infectious diseases that, um, you know, people used to die of. And I think it's just people didn't quite believe that it could be it could be serious and that's because no one's got any living memory of it i mean you know 100 years ago um people lots children used to die of infectious diseases my granddad's sister died of diphtheria that was very common now we just don't have that collective memory of infectious diseases and i imagine next time people would behave differently and would, you know, because they remember what has happened, what has happened this time. Yeah, it's very, you're very, uh, I think that's such an interesting, I, was, I, I remember such an interesting, I, was, I remember chatting to a guy from Middlesbrough who was born in, uh, in uh, probably the mid to late thirties uh, doing a gig. And he was saying what no one remembers is when I was growing up, one day you go to school and Charlie wouldn't be there. And it was just, and, and, and that it's actually in a lot of people that we know, a lot of the older generation it is within their memory of the, a, a far greater fragility of life. Mm. so would you and i know this is crystal ball stuff so i apologize for throwing this at you but do do you feel that sh should we have a situation like this again and i realize this situation is not over but let's say in 20 years time, do, do you feel that lesson now would mean that we would have a different action from from uh the politicians and do you think that the the, the with because they always love saying lessons have been learned and of course so often that then they're not we then just move on after you've heard that do you feel the imprint is going to be strong enough that we would have a changed attitude? I, I think it's like an argument that the reason why countries in Asia reacted differently is because they have experience, they had experience of SARS and they knew what it was like. And so they treated it, it differently. But I mean, one of the things I remember early on in February and March is people were thinking that people wouldn't abide by lockdown, like it just couldn't be done here. And that's been shown to be wrong because people have abided by lockdown and it's been very effective. So I think uh, and schools have been closed and, um, you know, that's worked at controlling transmission. It's worked in the UK. And so I think, uh, yeah, it, it would be different in 10 or 20 years time if there was another outbreak. 
Do you, would anyone else like to add anything to that? For what? For what? No, I, I completely agree. agree. Yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a very good point about the, the the collective memory, and I think that 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 has to have changed now. I mean, this is this is the only sort of shared experience that we've all gone through as a country, you know, since the war, really. Um, and so that that's that's got to have an impact. Mm. I, I, it's not going to be the lockdown that's going to be a problem. It's me ever going out again. Now I found out <laughs> we can do infinite monkey cage from home. I'm, I'm happy here. It's fine. It's near all the stuff. Now, RNA vaccines. I'm going to point at you, Sheena. I hope that's all right if we go here. This this is from uh, Sam. Sam says there's been much talk of how COVID-19 needs an RNA vaccine. What is this and how different is this from other forms, other forms of, vaccine? of vaccine? Right. There's, the, I mean, this is a great question. And um, I think it's worth remembering there are lots of different ways to design a vaccine. There's seven or eight that I can think of off the top of my head. An RNA vaccine um, is a particular type of vaccine. And what you're doing is you're introducing the message RNA. So that's the, the molecule that kind of tells cells what to build, what proteins to build. Um, and that mRNA is coded for the disease-specific antigens, which are the bits the immune cells, those T cells, those B cells, recognize. And then the idea is because you're putting it inside a cell, and it's part of a normal cell's machinery to make the proteins is the cell will then make the protein express it and then the t cells and the b cells can can react to it and they think it's like the real thing but of course it's not and the advantage is that the the rna will degrade it will not survive it's not an infectious molecule so it's not going to cause an infection and the the really great thing about it is that this is something that's relatively easy to manufacture um, and early clinical trials suggest that RNA vaccines are quite good. So from a point of view of kind of scaling something up really quickly and something that's that's likely to be very safe, to, safe and tolerated well, this is a really great um, candidate. There can be kind of issues around getting it into the cells it needs to get to. Um, so there are tricks to do that and there can be some challenges around you know provoking the right immune response or storing it but relatively speaking this is this is quite a good kind of model of, of, of vaccine and some of the initial studies using uh, DNA vaccines which is very similar also suggest that this is going to give a kind of really good um, kind of level of, of T or B cell responses there are lots of other different vaccines they work in slightly different ways so they might have like a, a whole version of, of the of the germ or a killed version of the germ or they might have taken the kind of bit that they think the immune response will recognize but the the difficulty of knowing of doing that is making sure it's in the right form that the immune response can see and you need to know a little bit more about the immune response so the the rna is a really good way to kind of do it quite quickly i hope that's clear it's quite hard to explain well of. they can rewind and watch it again so that's fine it's one of those <laughs> that's what that's what i do all the time with science it's very important to rewind and watch it again um ed sorry did you want to add anything i just saw you leaning no, in no, 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 no. This, that was, um, that was perfect <laughs> again this is another question which is uh, kind of reflected in uh, there's a few people asking about this we've slightly covered some of this but i think also there's an area which it, this is from zaheed who would like to know what's the latest evidence of there being some group immunity due to the spread of the virus to date and or general immunity from other coronavirus which i suppose is, is certainly something we haven't yet talked about um ellen can we start with you I, I think you should start with someone else. I don't know. Ed, can we start with you? Um, well, well, there's 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 now quite a lot of um, zero prevalence data from from lots of different sources, which you know that tell us um, uh, how many people in, a, in the proportion of a given population that have been exposed to the virus and, and got antibodies, um, and it's you know somewhere between sort of five percent up to sort of twenty uh, percent in in hotspots. I think the Bergamo, the city of Bergamo, which was which was, uh, you know, obviously very seriously hit early on in, in Italy. Um, there's, that's more like 40, 50 percent. Um, but by and large, it's still a long way off the 60 odd percent um, that supposedly needed for herd immunity. Um, so I obviously some immunity in, in the population is going to help a bit, but to get to this magic threshold of, of herd immunity, the, the sense I get is that we're, we're still 
um, a, a long way off that. Um, and the, the second point, I think, was about this, this recent uh, studies on um, uh, cross immunity. So the idea that previous exposure to a different coronavirus that causes uh, common colds uh, may have actually uh, left the body with some protection in the form of these T cells, um, which are still floating about and may actually offer some protection against uh, the, the um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, Sheena will know a lot more about this than me, but um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of two high profile studies, one of which says that happens and the other one says it doesn't. So <laughs> that's as far as I've got with that issue, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> that does seem to be, I think, the problem with when you are having finally you know science in the forefront which of course doesn't happen yeah. enough uh yeah. in the news and mass media which means at the moment there, which is that idea of going where's the one answer yeah, where's exactly. the one and and that that to seems to be until someone tells me what the answer is. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so they, they definitely seem to be suggesting both things at, at the, the, the moment i think there's at least two studies now that say Yes, there could be a degree of antibodies, which are from the B cells, the other really important part of our memory response and T cell responses. And then another two studies have, have come out and said the exact opposite. And, you know, one of the reasons for this might be they've used slightly different ways to, to analyze the data. And um, so they've used different measurement systems and the measurement systems are a little bit you know, more or less sensitive and, and perhaps they're picking up things differently as a consequence. And also it could be there are very different populations that were used in the studies and the populations may have had different exposure to different types of coronavirus that happen to be used in, in, in samples. So we still don't know. Um, it's kind of the longer version of what you just said, but with a little bit more yeah. immunology detail, which is just probably going to drive people nuts, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the final thing I'd just like to ask all three of you, just from your own personal Oops. perspective, is how are you living your life now? How are you from from your, you know, with, with what you know? Because I know that some people are worried that they're, they're being overly cautious, but they're, you know, what is the balance you'll find? Ellen, could I ask you first in terms of what advice from your personal way you're living your life? Uh, do you think people should still be what 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 are the good still be doing? Well, I don't know if I can offer any advice. I was spending a lot of time at home <laughs> with the kids. Um, and I mean, my kids, uh, I've got a year one and he's going to school now. So, um, I mean, yeah, it involves much more being at home. And um, I mean, yeah, it's been, you mentioned the nice weather. It's been great spending more time outside, spending more time with the kids and um but on, on the on the negatives i spend a lot of time on zoom um i could do with not being on 10 zoom calls a day you can go now uh that's fine <laughs> you're done fine. you're done get out of it uh the um ed again i, I just I, I said not necessarily giving people advice but just from your own personal perspective of 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 how how your the changes that you're continuing to implement from, from, from your own personal choices um so I'd agree about Zoom. <laughs> it's really annoying. Um, but I guess, you know, the advice that we've had from the university, and I guess that that's general employers across the country, is that um, that we, if you don't have to go back to work, then don't. And I haven't gone back to work yet. Our labs still aren't open in Bath. Um, so I'm feeling, you know, kind of institutionalised in a more domestic way. <laughs> I suppose you could put it like that. But I've kind of got used to it. Um, and I don't, I don't mind it. I, you know, like Ellen, it, it, it's, it's good to spend more time with uh, my daughter and everything. Um, I think it, it's kind of interesting how my perception of risk has changed over the last few weeks. Because, you know, when when we first went into lockdown, it's like going down to to, to the local Tesco Express to get a pint of milk felt like it was playing, you know. Russian roulette it felt every time you pass someone on the pavement you'd hold your breath I don't know if you did that and but I've I've slowly slowly sort of getting out of that phase now um but I still uh you know will observe the social distancing distancing as much as you can we've we've got masks I do wear masks occasionally and I find it actually um I know that there was all the uh, debate around wearing masks gives you a full sense of security but I found that having a mask on it's like a constant reminder Almost. So I've actually felt more 
uh like like aware and so i've been more alert <laughs> to use the government uh, phrase um wearing a mask I, I think so so that's kind of an interesting uh uh perspective but yeah so and you know i hope the the the, the cycling thing um <laughs> but i'd like to see more people cycle and you know there's a lot of good things that could come from this um but i i i think it's we're still in for a bit of a long haul i think it's going to rumble on and and we are in a kind of a bit of a strange limbo at the moment um and the the, the onus is on us to you know to use a bit of common sense and the, the guidelines aren't quite so clear and that's going to be the case so you know i think we, we're just going to have to to to, to sort of muddle through really <laughs> Well, yeah, the mask problem that I found was yeah. that when I was in the post office, I noticed the mask was slightly, I'd, I'd taken it off at that point, and uh, it yeah. was slightly tipping over the bag, and it looked rather like a thong, and I didn't <laughs> want anyone to think that I'd been shopping for thongs, so that's, uh, I'm going to get a different design of mask. mask. Um, Sheena? Why do I get to follow up thongs? Oh, sorry, don't, no, the conversation <laughs> hasn't moved on to thongs, I should make that clear. We're still back with the previous question. Um, I think, so what, what, have, what have I found? I think one of the things I've enjoyed is having, in some ways I have less time, but in some ways I have, I have more time. So just like little moments, like having a coffee with my husband has felt like a real treat taking the dog out. I mean, we, we invested in a puppy about 10 months ago and, you know, it's been great having that excuse to, to go out and enjoy nature. I'm really enjoying nature and seeing the air being cleaner what I haven't enjoyed is how worried I am for my lab and how worried I am about their well-being and, and what they're doing and much more so than I normally am. And we're at this really interesting uh, point. You sort of catch me as I finished a meeting not long before I came on here where we're talking about reopening and, and how we're going to manage reopening. And that is just blowing my mind trying to think about what my research future is going to look like, how my lab are going to be safe, having conversations with them about their journeys into work and keeping themselves safe. So it's all coming crashing back. So I've had the lovely little slight bubble in a way of, of going, oh, look at the birds. It's wonderful. And now going, oh, crikey how am I my lab going to get in and are they going to be okay and and you know how are we all going to share the lab because we work in a multi-group lab there's about uh, nine ten PIs principal investigators all in the lab and um, so how are we all going to share that limited space as we're all keeping two meters apart and and, and without me being in the building <laughs> So it would be uh, fair. Uh, sorry, Ed, we want to, to add to I was going to say, my group might be watching this and they're going to be thinking, oh, he didn't say that. He doesn't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, is it fair to summarise that as saying that what, what, for those who have some a choice, if you have a choice, just remain, keep the same caution that you've had before and just, you know, to have the, because I think some, some people we are say so it's all over and done with. But if you have a choice, and I know a lot of people don't, yeah. Um, the caution is still but so thank you so much for uh for, for joining us ellen ed and sheena and uh i should say there's uh the more stuff on cosmic shambles.com and uh, you can go to patreon.com uh slash cosmic shambles and also cat arnie is uh is currently doing a new series as well called genetics unzipped and uh cat's written some lovely stuff i'm sure many of you know so the genetics society putting out a fortnightly podcast uh genetics unzipped uh Keep it. Uh, uh, one quick thing, actually, I'll, uh, just to add as well. well I'm not going to let it, let this Zoom meeting end. Sorry, Ellen, it's not going to end. No, <laughs> um, you know, I've had exactly the same. The really is you end up. That's why I called Ed Paul. Is you end up just going. I don't know who's in the boxes anymore because what we're seeing, obviously, people at home see, but there's just boxes. That used to be Paul's box. Now it's Ed's box. Um, but uh, where for you are the best places for people to get information? You know, easily comprehensible information to keep up to date because the newspapers, of course, we get so much. We're bombarded. Where are the places to go for the reliable information? Uh, Ellen, starting with you. Well, uh, so there's an online magazine called The Conversation that has easily uh, kind of um, pub, uh, kind of non-technical accessible articles written by scientists. Also, the Science Media Center produces digests of um What's going on in science? Ed? Both of those are excellent sources. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, um, last time uh, this came up, I said I've actually found Twitter uh, surprisingly useful, which I still do, um, following the following a limited number of, of very trusted people. Um, but I, have, I must admit that um, the difference between the last 
time we did this and now in terms of the amount of information and papers that have come out it, it's just overwhelming and you know you very quickly realize that you can't actually keep up in quite the same way that you you were at the beginning um so you do have to be a bit more selective so um it, it's it's more it's more difficult and it seems that there's some things that still haven't gone away like there was a story about there's still the story about it accidentally coming out of a lab and all this stuff and you know so however much we learn and feel like we're moving on every now and then it feels like we're all dragged back to to these these ridiculous conspiracy theories again which which is really frustrating but um yes but conversation uh, uh, is 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 fantastic and the science media center have been absolutely awesome as well with their with their digest and sheena yeah yeah can i can i, can I plug we've we had done and i've actually can. written dan and i've actually written two pieces on immunology of covid in uh, the conversation and the second one came out today ironically <laughs> Um, so yeah, obviously, I think that's that that's great. Um, the other person that I, I read, I agree with with you about Twitter. I think there's been some really good people that I always follow on Twitter and completely trust. And I'm I'm very lucky. I've got a collection of um, infectious disease specialist buds that I have. We have a little WhatsApp group, so we we share a lot of stuff. But the other person who's writing, I'm really enjoying at the moment, is Ed Young, and I think a lot of his pieces are very very insightful in the Atlantic. So that's another place. I would remain, mate. Thank you all very much. And reminder again, Genetics Unzip from Genetics Society with Kat Arney and also uh, Cosmic Shambles. If you go patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. Thanks very much. Uh, we will be back. We will be. Uh, thank you very much again to uh, all the people who have made uh, this possible. And hopefully we will see you next time. Bye bye. Bye.